How can you, we know that we've been chosen? Can that really be true? The doctrine of election is being uh, or being chosen by God is a disturbing uh, uh, doctrine. It's disturbing for many people. They say it's somehow unfair and unjust. But God has ways and thoughts that are incomprehensible to human beings. Paul wrote, by his doing, Christ has become to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In Isaiah, let me see if I can move backwards. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. That's the starting point. We differ completely in the way that we are thinking. Now, I've decided to study the subject a bit deeper. Deeper and deeper. You can't go deep enough. Why? Because I picked up a piece of paper that says the president of the Texas University says the chosen doctrine is the most unreasonable, human belittling, God-dishonoring scheme of theology. It holds up a self-centered, selfish, heartless, remorseless tyrant for God and then he bids us to honor to uh, worship him. That shocked me. A president of a university. Another one wrote that I picked up. They say that to say that God sovereignly chooses who will be saved is the most twisted thing I've ever read in my life. That makes God a monster. No better than a pagan idol. Johannes, it's time for you to find out if this is true for myself. But we have the understanding that God is holy, that His nature is holy, and that He's infinite and perfectly just, and that He's morally flawless, and that He is total perfection. Let's start from that point. God makes determinations based upon nothing but His own free will. It is just because God wills it. In Romans 11.34, in Romans 11.34 it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? The end of our destiny, the end of our destiny is predetermined by the beginning. Our salvation is secure to the end because our salvation was predestined from the very beginning completed in Christ. And that's what we're going to cover. I also pick up many scriptures that can confirm in Romans 8 it says, Paul wrote here, For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. He foreknew and he predestined. God does a thing because it is good and right, and good is right because God is good and right. How could God ever be called unjust? Because every one of us, every one of us are sinners, doomed to death and to hell. Every one of us. Salvation has never been a matter of fairness. And yet, that's what people think and say. But election is rooted in pure grace from God. He is most gracious to those to whom grace seems most undeserved, including me. In Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1 26. It's quite a long one. For consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are not, and the, ba and the base things of the world and despised God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify things that are, that no man should boast before God. Can I really then stand up and say, God, you're a monster? That means our divine calling to salvation is a call of God and nothing else. His grace stoops down to the most undeserving so that no one, but no one, could boast. 
If you're in Christ Jesus, it is by God's doing, not ours. It is written, let, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That means it's pure grace. And God has chosen to give that grace to those to whom it might seem so unfair. Like you and me. Unfair. We must come to the Word of God and we must look at what the Scripture says to reveal the truth as the chosen ones. We must set all things aside and submit ourselves and study the Word of God and see what it says. The doctrine of election or chosen appears in the Old Testament. It's not just the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament I came across one family. Just think about it. All of us are eliminated, but that one family sitting over there was saved. No one. Everyone else, gone. That was God's choice. Another one. Abraham. One person. Not all of the people that lived. One person. He chose Abraham. It goes further. One nation. All the rest were ignored. One nation. That's God's doing. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Let's go there and see what Moses wrote. The Lord your God has chosen you to be people for his own possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. God, but that's unfair. Really? John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So now we move to the New Testament. That's exactly the words that Jesus said. I chose you, including Judas, Judas Iscariot. In the New Testament, the church is called the elect, the chosen bride. That's the New Testament. Romans 8.33. Let's go to Romans 8.33. Those of us are believe, of who are believers in the family of God, who have been redeemed, regenerated, reconciled, we now belong to God. We have been declared righteous. Wow. And then it says, who will bring a charge against us? God is the one who justifies. And God declares that we are righteous before Him. And no one can successfully accuse us, not even Satan. Is that what elect? Is that the way we uh, God elected us? Let's go to John 17. Jesus prayed, "I ask on their behalf." Jesus is praying here for his disciples. I do not ask on. I do not ask on behalf of the world but of those to whom you have given me, Jesus says. Now listen to this. For they, the chosen ones, are thine. You chose them, God, and you are giving them to me. Look at their beautiful sunshine. Welcome to South Africa. They belong to you, Father. You chose them and you gave them to me. Acts 13, 38. Let's go to Acts 13, 48, sorry. When the Gentiles heard this, now this is the Gentiles heard the message of salvation. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And listen to this. And as many had been appointed to eternal life, believe. Appointed. God who has mercy does not depend upon the human will, but on himself alone. In 1 Peter, I'm just going to run through a few of the scriptures. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, To those who reside as aliens, who are chosen. The word just keeps on popping up all over where I investigated. 1 Corinthians 1.9 God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The next one, Ephesians. Ephesians uh, 1.4 Just as He chose us in Him, that's in Christ, before the foundation of the world, long ago, 
that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Note, He chose us before the foundation of the world. We are chosen for final holiness and blamelessness. In love, as we sang this morning, in love we were predestined to be adopted as children through Christ, so that in the end, here is the one that I want you to know, in the end, all glory and praise will be to God, for His grace was stowed upon us freely. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4, I shortened this one a little bit. I've seen your work, Paul writes, your work of faith. I've seen your labor of love. I've, I've seen your steadfast, steadfastness in the hope and the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. And knowing, brethren, by all of that, beloved of God, His choice of you. It just keeps on coming up. It should be evident then, in the way that you and me live in this world, that we have been chosen by God Himself, not of our doing. We are sinners. No wonder, Paul wrote, we are in this world but not of this world. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 and 14. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Chosen you from the beginning by the Spirit. It begins at the point of salvation where we are separated from sin. It was for this he called you through the gospel, all right, so that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we should become like Christ. He chose us that we should be blameless and holy. He chose us that we should be ultimately in the presence of his glory. His glory. He chose us that we would gain the very glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He chose us that we would bear the image of His Son Jesus one day. No wonder Paul wrote, Rejoice! Again I say rejoice. If I just look at this, I can only say, Thank you God. Thank you. If you believe the Bible, then you believe that God calls those that He chooses and grants them faith. But God, that's unfair. Let's go to the next one. Romans 9.20 Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? There's the answer. Some are accusing God of an unjust condemnation and some are accusing God as being evil. If I go further on Romans 9.21 and I don't have it, doesn't the, pot, doesn't the pot have the right over the clay to make the same lump? I give you a lump of clay and I say make something beautiful out of this. From the same lump, the lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. The clay is far beneath the potter. We are just dirt. We are just dirt. We have no right to accuse the potter. No right. Go one step one further down. Verse 22. He endured with much patience vessels of wrath. He endured. You pick that up. He endured patience vessels of wrath. It never says that God created vessels prepared for destruction. That's not what it says. God doesn't go down the list and say to the human beings, oh, you go to hell, you go to heaven, and those three, uh, I think, will also go to heaven. God does not operate that way. That's not the way. No. The Bible teaches that all people are sinners on their way to hell guilty of sin. God has every right to demonstrate His wrath and that He is much glorified 
in his wrath as in his mercy. He's much glorified in his wrath than in his mercy. Verse 23, drop down. He will make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy. That's the way that he created us. Vessels of mercy because of God. And there is, the verb is very active. He makes vessels of mercy. He endures those that are fitted for destruction. He endures them. Come to me. God is active in redemption. He wishes all human beings will repent. He is passive in reprobation. He is the heavenly Father who takes hold of our fallen humanity like a lump of clay. God is God and He loves us. And that's the way that God operates. But this doctrine of election is not easy to accept. The doctrine hurts some people. But let me make you feel a little bit better. Are you ready for it? It is so painful that only the only reason that you and me believe this is because it's written in the scripture. Otherwise, there was no way that I would believe all this. I can't fully grasp the Trinity. Can you? Can you please explain to me the Trinity in full detail, right from beginning to end? Does it mean that it's not true? I can't comprehend the character of Christ. Can you describe Christ for me and His character? Can you describe His nature? There are so many things that I cannot understand. So many things that are incomprehensible. But I believe them because they are written in the Word of God. He does not... He does that work how does the work of being chosen fit into this? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I just go back to the Bible. But aren't we comforted, comforted in the fact that we don't know? Because if we had the mind of God, the world would be horrific. Horrific! Where everyone is just making choice, choices. And because we believe in the doctrine of election, doesn't mean we don't believe in human responsibility. We know that Christ lives in us. We all know that. And if I sin, who sins? Jesus or me? How can you explain that? That to me is a paradox. Who can resolve that? So, the unmistakable teaching of the scripture is the doctrine of election. I read in Peter, to those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, comes up again. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. What does foreknowledge mean? It's predetermined choice. Christ was foreknown. That is, Christ was known by God in the intimate sense as the Savior, the Redeemer, known by God in the intimate sense of the Savior, the Redeemer, before the foundation of the world. Predetermined choice is talking about the intimate kind of knowing. Predetermined. John 10, I picked up this where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. That's intimate relationship with the Savior. Just as the Father had a predetermined relationship with the Son that would bring him to the sacrifice for sin, so that the Father had a predetermined relationship with us whom he chose. Predetermined or foreknowledge is a deliberate choice. Acts 2, I pick up this. Here's Peter. They all shout him. They all say, we crucified him. And Peter wrote, This Jesus whom you crucified. But it was predetermined by God. It was part of God's pre foreknown knowledge. Predetermined. The Bible is very clear on the doctrine of election. A compelling question is as to why God did it this way. Can generate some very 
eat the onions. Why did God do it this way? There are people who hate the thought of divine election. There are some people who say the doctrine is demonic. The doctrine is satanic. It's hard doctrine to accept. But I'm not God. My human reason is fallen completely. And so does all humanity. We cannot design God. Can you design God to fit our reasoning? Who cannot design? We cannot design God to act so that we can think like Him. Design God to say, God, I want you to think like me. Our reasoning and our emotions are corrupted by the flesh and must be brought under the authority of Scripture. I do understand that the idea that God chooses people for salvation is a hard thing to accept. Very hard. Denying the doctrine of predestination doesn't change anything. Because if I say that you are able to go to heaven based on your own choice, are you going to heaven? Make a choice quickly. Are you going to heaven? Yes. Everyone will say yes, regardless of who you are. It gives it God, if God leaves it completely up to us, everyone will be in heaven. Right? Another question is, does God know what you will do? The question to this is, yes, He does what you are going to do if, because He knows everything. God never ever planned to save every individual on earth ever born from Adam and Eve right up to today. Because God can do whatever He pur pur purposes to do. So the question is who chooses who? And the answer is found in the scripture. Moses said, as I said, all nations God chose, out of all nations God chose you. God made a choice and he passed by all the other nations. And then same thing I picked it up in the New Testament. Jesus says, many are called but few are chosen. Again it pops up there. Many are called but few are chosen. I go to uh, 2 Timothy 2.10. 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Isn't that beautiful? I endure all things. Wow. God has chosen people and their choosing has to come from hearing the gospel. Exactly what Paul said. They have to hear the gospel. I read in Revelation, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Records before the foundation of the world. It's a decision that God made himself. The Lord knows those who are his. In John 3, I picked up, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Well-known verse that most of us know in the Christian religion, uh, religion. We go further. It starts by hearing the gospel and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Whatever happens, whenever it happens, wherever it happens, to whom it ever happens, it happens by the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a birth from above. In the end, God gets all the glory. God wanted to receive all the glory right from the beginning. If you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. If, you're, if it's about God's choice, not our own choosing. I picked up in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Can we tell God what to do and what not to do? Because from Him and through Him and to Him all things, to Him be the glory forever and ever and ever. I pick up in Titus 3. He saved us. It was by His power, His will, according to His purpose. So the question is, have you been chosen? I would like to ask a question. 
Do you have a yearning for God's word? To know the truth and nothing else but the truth that you heard. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What does that mean? We came to listen to God's word today because God drew us, not our own will. He moved our will and we responded to His will. When we want somebody to come to the Lord, you got this? When you want someone to come to the Lord, you pray. You do what? You pray more. You do what? You pray more. You pray that the Holy Spirit would turn that person to the person's heart to Christ. That the hurricane of the Holy Spirit would come through this individual soul. The Holy Spirit will do it. God has called that person and the Holy Spirit then encourage that person. We pray that the Holy Spirit would make that person willing to believe, willing to repent, and if it is possible for me to lose my salvation, I would lose it ten times a day. Did you hear that? If it was possible for me to lose my salvation, I would lose it ten times a day. But the Holy Spirit keeps on encouraging us. I can't save myself or keep myself safe. God chose us. He awakened our hearts and our world and He activated all of us that we might surrender to His Son, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 46.10 Isaiah 46.10 He knows the end from the beginning. Very clear. He knows the end from the beginning. He not only knows the future, He ordains the future. He ordains the future. And if He ordains the future, He makes the future happen. If God does not know the future, then God didn't know that His Son was going to die for our sins. So He ordains the future. The doctrine of election is a dangerous doctrine. Yes, it's dangerous to discuss. For it turns God into a monster. You go, you don't. You go, you don't. Let us rather bow our knees to this great truth of divine election. And when we do it, it may become, listen to this, if we bow our knees before the sovereign God, this may become the most precious doctrine of all doctrines in Scripture. And that encouraged me. To spread the gospel is a command, Jesus said. The Bible says we are commanded to spread the gospel to every creature. And I know that the Bible commands all men, wherever they are, to repent. And God demands that all people must believe in His Son. I also know that Jesus says, Come to me, all of you that labor and are heavily, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now is that choosing you and you and you don't? All of you. I also know he said, Whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. I also know that the Bible says that all people are sinners, and all sinners are personally guilty of violating God's law, and all deserve eternal punishment. Does that turn God into a monster? But the Bible also indicates that all human beings can see God's creation. If you look at the creation of God, whether you're a believer or not, you look at some beautiful creation of God. And you recognize there must be a creator behind this beauty, even though whether you're a believer or not. Paul says that's a mystery of God. There's a mystery unfolding for us in Scripture that tells us that no sinner is capable of understanding the truth. The natural man does not understand the things of God. The preaching of the cross is foolish to them. Don't tell me about the cross. Because no sinner is capable of repenting by themselves. I picked up in Acts 11, the only way a sinner could ever repent is if God grants him repentance. As many as received him, it says in verse 18, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Believing does not come by the will of man. Human beings are incapable of understanding the gospel, only the Holy Spirit. So, 
that the only way any sinner can be redeemed by the work of God, God has to grant understanding. Grant understanding. Grant repentance. Grant faith. By faith you've been saved. From God. God has the power, uh, God has to overpower the spiritual death and give life. We in spiritual death, God gives life. Spiritual blindness, God gives light. Overpower spiritual ignorance, He gives truth. Overpower our continuous love for sin and replace it with the desire and the yearning for righteousness. If that's in your heart, God is knocking on your door. Jesus is knocking. That's awesome. Why did God choose to rescue sinners from His just judgment? Paul says here in Titus, I am a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul says, for the faith of the elect of God. Why is he doing it? Because of, for the faith of the elect of God. Paul says he, God has called him to serve, uh, to, to, in his service to preach the good news. Paul had no idea. Did Paul walk into a town and say, you, 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 will, you are believers, God has called him. No, Paul had no idea who they are. But he preached. And as he preached, people listened. God called. The Holy Spirit inspired. Just to mention, Paul's version is a picture of you and me. That's why God or Jesus says, go and spread the good news. Then people will hear it, and if God has chosen that person, the Holy Spirit will encourage that person. Jerry shocked me one day in his sermon. Every person you speak to during the day is God sent. I spoke to this little man. God sent. We don't know who the chosen are. There's no way that we can identify them. The decree of God and his sovereign election is a, se is a secret and it's hidden. Paul preached the gospel everywhere, knowing that the Lord will use him to bring the gospel to the elect and will eventually believe. And that's exactly what happened. That's the ministry of evangelism. We bring the gospel to strangers so that the elect will hear it and believe it. It starts with evangelism. It moves to edification. Once people have believed, they need to be taught the truth so that they can grow in the likeness of Christ. Come here. That's salvation, followed by sanctification. Another aspect is encouragement and a hope for future glory. Most people on the world, in the world at the moment don't have this hope of future glory. Paul sums it up and says, First of all, I preach the gospel so the elect can hear it and believe in it. Then he teaches the word for those who believe so that they can grow in the knowledge of truth and grow in godliness. And then I tell them about the eternal life to come so that they can come and live in hope. And this hope becomes a great comfort. Salvation, sanctification, glorification. Glory to God. Not our own will. And all we have the responsibility all we have to do is to spread the gospel. Before time again, God promised that He would save and sanctify and glorify believers according to His own choice. In 2 Timothy, let's go to 2 Timothy. God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, as we've been previously taught, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Jesus Christ. That's the calling. Years ago, the Father, at some point in eternal past, eternity past, says to the Son, I am going 
to redeem sinners for you. I'm going to do it for you. The Father determines in His eternal love with the Trinity that He will express His love for the Son by giving the Son a special gift. He's going to give His Son a special gift. The chosen ones, the redeemed humanity. He gives His Son a perfect bride. I remember the day when my wife walked down there. Perfect bride. I can clearly see it in my mind. John 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. The Father called. And then you go to Jesus. Every safe person is a gift from the Father to the Son. The Son had to give up His own life to pay the price to purchase that bride. I come from Africa and they still do that. Call Labala. Labala, you pay for your wife to the parents of the wife. The whole redemptive history is about the father pursuing his bride for the uh, uh, pursuing a bride for his son. The father determined before the foundation of the world that the bride would be, and he wrote their names in the book in the Lamb Book of Records. It's staggering. You can't understand it. You can't repent on your own. You can't believe on your own. You can't come to him on your own. Only when you are chosen. You are a gift from the Father to the Son. Then you will come to Jesus. The value is not in the gift. The value is in the giver of the gift. John 6, 39. Look at this. I must not lose any one God has given me, but I must raise them up on the last day. This is what the one who sent me wants me to do. That's very clear. The Father chooses a bride. In time, as history unfolds, those whom the Father has chosen are given to the Son. When they hear the Gospel, when they hear the Gospel, they repent and ask for more, and the Holy Spirit will then come in. When they hear the Gospel and repent and believe, the Son receives them. The elect have been God, been God's sons, they were chosen from the beginning. And he gives it as a gift to his son. When you're a believer, when you're a believer, you are a gift from God to his beloved son. And here is a very, and I'd like you to put this in your mind, here's a very deep prayer of Jesus that sums it up. I'm about to leave this earth, Jesus says. They are, which is the chosen ones, going to be here alone. I'm going to go up, they're going to be here alone. While I'm coming to you, I'm asking you, Father, to keep them safe. I have kept them safe up to now. Wow. Father, I want you to keep them. The moment when Jesus was separated from his Father, God stepped in and kept his chosen ones. And since Christ descended to glory, he sent his Holy Spirit, which is a guarantee or a down payment, who keeps us and seals us. We are precious. You can tell yourself, I am a precious child of God, loved by God, given as a bride to Christ. We've been given the Son as a gift of love from the Father. I want them to see my glory, Jesus said. Father, I want to have them to come to the great wedding feast. When Jesus returns. Revelation. What will we do? We will surround the, the, the throne of God and sing. Worthy is the Lamb. And we will have a body like Christ. Christ. This is the way that one must understand chosen or election. All believers will be there. Then the mystery of redemption will be complete. God is merciful to us, not because of some, of some value. Have you got any value that you can contribute to God? No, because God, 
He so values his son as to give a redeemed humanity the bride, and then Jesus will give himself with the bride as a reciprocal back to God because of love. The Father makes the Son to pay for the sin, a painful price for an unworthy bride. You and me, an unworthy bride. The election is pride crushing, if you think about it. Election is pride crushing. I can't boast. Nothing but humility. No wonder it says, humble yourselves before the throne of grace and he will raise you up on the last day. It is not what we are, that we are better than anybody else. Not at all. It is that we have been chosen by God. This is crushing and all pride goes out the window. The doctrine is also God exalting. God exalting. It gives all the glory to God. Unto thy name I give glory. It's also joy producing. It plants in our hearts a sort of overwhelming joy to walk with Christ. It is also holiness producing. Shall I go astray and say, God, I don't want this? Never. I will say to God, I love you and I give myself to you forever and ever. It's also strength giving. It makes me at peace with every situation. I see people lose their temper. It gives me peace in every situation. Holy Spirit gives me wisdom of peace, it says. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will perform it until the day Christ returns. He who began Let's sum it up. It's pride crushing, it's God exalting, it's joy producing, it's privilege granting, it's holiness promoting, and it's strength given. How awesome! And I'm so grateful that it was written for us in the scripture. Everyone who surrenders himself to Christ and accepted Christ should be grateful as a chosen one by God himself. We must glorify, let's end. We must glorify God because we are incapable of believing the truth about being chosen. We are incapable of understanding this. But let's conclude. Are you yearning for the truth? When you believe in your heart that Christ came from the Father, born of a woman, who gave us the good news that we are going through now, who was crucified for my sins and your sins, was raised up and ascended up into heaven and left us here behind, then God is calling you. Loud and clear, God is calling you. Jesus is knocking on your door. And then he pours out his Holy Spirit to seal us, to encourage us, to produce holiness, strength giving and peace. It's a narrow road. It's a very narrow road that we're walking until Jesus returns. Have you surrendered and accepted? If you have not, that's the way. Surrender to Christ and give yourself to Him. That's the truth that shall make you free. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we are so thankful for our calling that is explained in your word, even though we can't fully comprehend it, we know it is your understanding and not for us. You want us to put our trust in Jesus and to follow him, to take up our cross and follow him. We thank you, Jesus, for you, what you've done on the cross for all of humanity. You've given us the command to spread the good news of salvation. And we know, Jesus, that you weep over those who reject this, but you still want us to love them and not to judge them. It is beyond us. It leaves us overwhelmed with joy to think that we're walking with you, Jesus. We don't know why you awakened us. Why are we here today? But help us to grasp a glimpse of your word and know that you have a great plan for us. We pray, Holy Spirit, 
that you would guide us to others who Christ has chosen, that God has chosen them and bring them and for us to spread the gospel and bring them to Christ. Use us as instruments like what you did with Paul to bring the truth to the elect. They can hear it, believe it, and those believe can come to the knowledge of that truth, of hope, eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that has come to us in Christ. We will come to the whole world eventually in the presence of a sovereign God. We look forward to that day in our, with joy in our hearts. Father, you planned this before the world began and you will bring it to pass. No matter what humanity are doing, you want to respond in you want us to respond in obedience and surrender to you. Surrender to you. To express our love to you and to help a neighbor. We love you because you, God, loved us first. We offer ourselves from today as servants to you. Father, we also ask for the blessing on the finger food that we'll be enjoying, for the fellowship in. Let us share the good news and go out into the world and spread the good news that Jesus Christ loves us and there is great hope in that. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray it. Amen. Amen.